And uh, I thank God for this fellowship and what God's doing in our church. Every day you come around here, you see different things happening. I mean, I hear stories all the time. Uh, weekly get texts or emails or whatever from people just sharing what, what the Lord's doing in their life and how they're responding. I had one of the widows called the church this last week on Valentine's Day, say, uh, can you give me so-and-so's number? I, we need to get their number. And the secretary asks, you know, we don't like to give out your phone numbers to people just call and ask for them. Uh, he said, well, can I help you? He said, well, ever since my husband passed away, this particular couple on, on, uh, on Valentine's sends me flowers and a card. You know, and I thought to myself, that's, that's just believer's fellowship, amen? Just people doing and ministering and sharing and serving and helping. I mean, you think about it, really, I mean, you came to church this morning. Did you notice somebody mowed the yard or at least paid to have it mowed, Amen. The lights were on, air conditioners working most of the time, not always to my liking, but it's still functional, amen. <laughs> it's either hot or it's warm or cold, whatever we need it. I never go into the bathrooms here that there's not some toilet paper. You know, I get that my help at the house, me and Kathy be happy, amen. Well, you go get it, you know, you go get it. So, it's just, I mean, the sinks are clean, the halls are clean, the building's clean. Somebody greets you. You have that home. Somebody greet you at your door. Welcome. You, give you a happy day. Helps you to where the children's ministries are. Take care of your kids. You know, feeds your babies and takes disciples your children. Uh, you, you know, it's just it, everywhere you turn around here, somebody's doing something for the Lord in this fellowship. I, they're either giving and providing all the blessings that we have from the utilities on and all the services that we have, or they're just making sure those things are functional. They set the thermostats. They, they get the sound system set up. The band gets here early. They practice. They prepare. Somebody's in the sound booth. Somebody's running the PowerPoints and the, and the videos. Everywhere you turn, somebody's doing something. We had a funeral here on Saturday. Somebody was there to take care of the family and minister to the family and feed the family. You, you guys are just, you're exceptional I want you to know that it's not overlooked on your pastors, the staff's part. All you do for Jesus is, is valuable and it, it's important. I mean, somebody's helping somebody all the time and ministering to somebody all the time on some level. I mean, everywhere you turn, somebody's leading a lift group or teaching the youth or, or helping with, with, with some different area of ministry. Or they're praying for you or they're serving you or they're caring for you or they're giving you something. Or if there's a benevolence need, they're there to take care of it. If there's a food need, they're, they're there to minister. If your children need clothes, they're, they're there. It's, I mean, I love this church. I mean, this list just goes on and on and on. You know, the last six weeks we talked about being stewards of the things that God's given us in, in regard to our, our money matters. And I received some great testimonies from people about what the Lord has been doing and as a result of that testimony. But I want to move from that series of money matters to ministry matters for a couple of weeks here. And ministry matters. And we can also talk about ministry matters, all right, at the same time. Because there are matters we need to discuss, and you need to understand that as you do those ministries, that they do matter in the long run. There's a passage in Matthew 8, uh, 16, which really kind of been an anthem for me in the church and the, in, in the, the vision for this church. We started almost 30 years ago. It says, I say unto you also that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Great, great, great word from the Lord is the Lord is telling Peter what's getting ready to happen. All right? Now, this, this is not saying that the Catholics have taken this to a little different level, but the, what it is not saying is that, Peter, you're the head of the church. I'm going to build my, my, you know, my, my church on you. Jesus says, and if you read this from the Greek, it said, you know, you are Petros, and I'm going to build my church on the Petro, the Petra, the large rock. Now, the word that you use, right, your name is Peter. Remember, it was Simon. He changed it to Peter. But just, Peter means a little rock, all right? You're a little rock, and I'm going to build my church on the big rock, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Scripture makes it very clear that the big rock, the chief cornerstone, is Jesus himself. That it really is all about him. And when you read this scripture, there's something that, I don't know about you, but it's radical, it's revolutionary, it's rebellious. It, it, according to what the world sees a church ought to be is a little, you know, nice little group sitting on the corner minding their own business. Here's a church who's out thrusting itself out into the world and making a difference. It says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I don't know about you, when you, when you come under siege of the devil, it's not like the devil says, okay, somebody, let's, let's go attack Believer's Church or this individual. Somebody bring the gates as we go. The gates are stationary. So that means that this is a picture not of a church that's standing there behind sword and shield, you know, kind of hiding from the devil, in case he attacks. 
This is an aggressive group that's moving towards into darkness, being radically revolutionary and overcoming the forces of hell itself. That's the picture that this verse is giving. That's the picture of a church that I want to be a part of. I don't want to be a member of the first church of pew warmers, all right? And you know, I just don't want to do it. I don't even like the word pew. It just stinks. You'll get to that in a minute, all right? But as you look at this, there aren't, you know, what does it take to have that kind of church? What does it take to have that kind of radical group of people who are doing stuff and making a difference and, and changing the world that they live in? Because ultimately, bottom line is this, guys. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth and you're the light of the world. Who's supposed to make the difference? It's not, the, it's not the Hollywood industry that's supposed to make the difference in the world. It's not the movie industry. It's not even government and politics. The real difference makers, according to what the Bible teaches, are the living people of God moving out in the world. In fact, in, in the book of Peter, when Peter's writing his letter to the church, he calls them living stones. All right? It's a good illustration for him to use because he's talking about himself as well. I, Jesus calls me, you know, a little rock. Well, you're all little rocks. We're all alive. We've all been made alive. And with the temple and the kingdom we're building is an active, moving, breathing kind of thing. So there's some things I want to just lay out to you this morning, about two or three things and about 400 under that. Maybe not that many. But just a couple of things here this morning that really give you the idea about ministry matters and what that really means in regard to our life. Because I do know beyond any shadow of a doubt, there are so many people in the world who don't get it. I mean, it's a dumb moment when it comes to Christianity and the church. They don't, they don't get it. They don't understand it. They don't comprehend it. They don't realize that when Christ comes into a life, he radically transforms that life. And if that person gets it and picks up on it and chooses to live that life, their life is forever changed. But not only is it forever changed, it has such value. Not only to that person themselves, but it provides value to the kingdom of God, value to other people's lives around them. In other words, we, like salt and light, we make a difference. And it's important we realize that and we embrace that because if we don't, we'll be just like any nominal, you know, dead pan kind of Christian who believes the Bible, who thinks and believes they're going to heaven, who believes that Jesus died for their sins, but all they do is kind of occupy a little square footage on the church premise on Sunday. And that's about as far as their Christianity goes. If it goes that far, there, there, there's nothing vitally alive and attacking the gates of hell about them. I want you to understand it today. I'm not going to condemn you for that. Man, I've been in that place before. Amen? And some of you have been, that's not the way God called you to live, though. God called you to a higher kind of living. Again, the world doesn't get it so often. But what's it take to get there? What does it take to be that kind of church? Well, I think the first thing Jesus is out here to Peter, I'm going to build this church. This is, this is an undertaking of the Lord himself. And he's the rock on which it's built. But not only is he the rock on which it's built, he's the leader of whom it follows. Now we have a leadership, and God gives us leadership models in the Bible of how the church should be structured in regard to organization and, and leadership within an organization. But the bottom line of all that is that he's in charge. You want to know who's in charge at Believer's Fellowship? Jesus. And that's the way we have to keep bringing it back to, and that is a constant kind of inventory process that the church goes through, the leadership of the church goes through, the elders, the deacons, the staff. We all want to always be sure that what we're doing is God-honoring, Jesus-glorifying, Holy Spirit-inspired. That's what we have to keep coming back to and functioning on because this is what it's really all about. It's not about me. And, and even when people start looking for a church, it's really not about the Lord in their, in their pursuit. It's about what can that church do for me? What can this church give me? What can, how can they help me? Now, it's nice to want to be ministered to, but ultimately, we ought to be saying, not only will how they minister to me, but how can I be used? Am I going to be able to, is this going to be a place where I can plug in and find my place to make a difference in the world I'm living in? It all comes back to this, that Jesus is the Lord, not only of your life, but he's the Lord of the church. Paul wrote the Ephesians and said, you know, that the, God has put all things under Jesus' feet. And given him, that's Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church. So Jesus is not only the head of the church, he's head of what? All things. He said, I don't know about that. He's not, he's not ahead of me. He is, you just don't know it. <laughs> you're going to discover it one day. And when you move into that, then your life's going to start making some sense. And you're going to start having some direction and some passion and purpose in your life. In Colossians, Paul's writing to the church at Colossians. He says, 
He is the head of the body, talking about Jesus. He's the head of the church. He's the beginning. He's the firstborn from the dead. That in all things that he might have the, the preeminence. In other words, that he would be the one who is head of all things. He'd be the one we look to. He's the one we follow. He's the one we surrender to. So if we're going to be that church on fire, and if we're going to be that individual on fire, it's got to go back to the lordship of Jesus in my life. I can't have a church that just focuses on me, my needs, and what I want. We put it before the Lord. Lord, what is the kind of church you want? Where are you taking this church? What do you want to do with this church? And what is your goal in the world in which we're living right now in with this fellowship? I mean, just if you look at this one verse on, the, on this leadership issue and this lordship issue of this, this verse in Matthew, there's about seven quick things we point out to you. One here, he says, I will build my church. In other words, this, the church, Believer's Fellowship, and every local church, this is a personal undertaking of God. You can be sure that God is interested in what goes on here. We're not kind of just kind of following a little book of directions and kind of hoping to somehow make some kind of influence. We truly believe that God guides us and the Lord leads us. We believe that through his word and the instruction of truth and by the leadership of his living Holy Spirit that he says he gives to each of us, that he'll guide us as a church as to what we're supposed to be doing, right? And how we're supposed to be living and how we can honor him. But understand, the Lord says, I will. It's personal. It's all his. But not only is it personal, it, this, is, this is a promise as well. When God says, I will do something, guess what? It, it's, it's done. Ain't no getter done. It's, it's done. All right? The Lord says, I'm going to do this. This is not a trial. This is not an experiment. This is not a test run. And see how it's going to work. God said, no, I'm, I'm in this. I'm behind this. I'm for this. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this. But not only that, it talks about performance. It says that not only will he do it, it means he's doing something. He is, he's doing what? He's building. I will build. He, he's the builder. He's the one who, who, who creates the growth in our lives and the maturity in our hearts and the depth of our church and even the, the dimensions in which it falls. But he's the rock and we're the living stones. We make up the material. But ultimately, he says, I will build my church. That's a personal possession, all right? We say, I love my church, but really we're just saying, I love our church, me and Jesus's. Amen? It's his church. I'm a part of it because he's called me to it and he's led me here to be a part of this. But you're here because God called you to be a part of it. So we love his church. We love what God's doing with our church. And not only is it a personal promise and a performance and a possession, it is, it is a project. When the word church is used in scripture, it literally translates about a called out group of people, a called out assembly. God calls out assemblies to do something within that, that perimeter, where they are, the, their sphere of influence in the world. Ultimately, as that church grows, that sphere of influence can even grow mightier and more global even in the influence that that church has. But understand, it's the Lord who's doing this. It's his church, it's his people. And what I love about this, and, and when he talks about it, he says he deals with this issue of protection. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And there are gates of hell, all right? There's problems. But again, we're not setting, setting back here in a defensive position. The church's place on the field of life is not a defensive mode. It's offensive. Now, I didn't mean to say we offend people, although that happens naturally anyway, all right? Because the world doesn't always get it. But there is this move where we're moving out. And we're not, we're not being quiet. And we're not trying to be politically correct or to fit into somebody's political agenda, right or left. We are a Bible-centered church. We're going to move forward according to the agenda that God has given us in Scripture. That's where we focus. Where's God leading? What's God doing? How's God want me to live my life? What is God working out in my life? And as I go, hey, I'm going to need protection. Why? Because I'm out in the enemy territory. I'm not staying in the safety zone. I'm not sitting on the bench somewhere. I'm out, I'm in the middle of the game, and I'm moving forward, and I'm progressing, not regressing. I'm going forward. And the Lord says here, as you do this, the gates of hell won't prevail against you. You're going you're to go, and you're going to face these strongholds, and you're going to see these issues you're going to have to deal with, but you're going to overcome it in, in those situations, in all those situations, because I promise you the power that you need so that the gates of hell will not prevail. So we have this promise of his protection, and I believe this is also a promise of the power and the authority that we need. Bottom line here, who's running the church? Jesus is running the church. How do we know Jesus is running the church? Because we take our instruction, and there's a lot of instruction in here of how the church should function, and how the church should operate, and how the church should be organized, and how the church should evangelize, and how the church should raise the standard. It's laid out here. So what we do is we find out what God is saying. 
which kind of leads me to the next point here. But when we get a grip on this is the Lord's church, it's going to change our attitudes. I mean, really, when I look at my church as the Lord's church, and I really say this is something God's doing. Obviously, God started. Obviously, God's maintained, it, maintained this for close to 30 years in this particular local fellowship. I know that God's doing a work here. So if I really realize but that it's the Lord and these elements come into play here, hey, it changes my mind about, about, about my brothers and sisters in the church. It changes my attitude about the way I approach the worship service, the way I worship in the service. The way I relate to my leadership, my, the deacons or the elders or the lift group leaders or the Bible teachers or the staff, just everything begins to change within the way I respond because I realize, hey, God is here. And God set this up and God's doing this. Let's just function according to the way he called us to function. And if we can do that, then we can flourish. Then we see what God does. Now, we are so blessed, and maybe you don't realize it because you haven't visited a lot of other churches, but at Believer's Fellowship, we are extremely blessed because I think the majority of the people at this church get this. I think they get this. I think they've, they've, they've understood this principle here is that this is all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's all about him. It's all about glorifying him. Not what I'm going to get out of this. Not, you know, not if it's going to interrupt the football game today. Hey, this is about Jesus. My day belongs to him. This is the Lord's. But lordship, that's first step. The second step to this of having this, this church that charges hell and makes a difference is, is light. And there's two areas that we, I want to talk about here when, when I talk about light. First of all is the light, which is the revelation of God's word. This is the Bible. This has been shunned. This has been buried. This has been burnt. This is, people, this is a book throughout history which has been sought to be completely eradicated by, by countries, by movements, by groups who thought, sought to get But yet it's still here. And yet remains to be the number one book still read in the world, the number one bestseller, because you can't get rid of this book. This is a living book. What does that mean? That means that God inspired these words and he speaks to us. Let me lay it out the way we have it in our, in our church documents about this church and its, its position on the Bible itself. All right? Our church's statement of faith says this. We believe that the Holy Bible is the inerrant, eternal, immutable, which means unchangeable, universal word of God, and that it is totally authoritative in all issues of faith and practice and is superior to all other instruction. Do you get that? Nothing's, nothing's higher instruction. The Bible is God's word to us, written by human authors who were under supernatural guidance of the Holy Spirit. It is the supreme source of truth, for Christian beliefs and living. Because it is inspired by God, it is the truth without any mixture of error. Now, there was a time in America when about 95% of those who claim to be uh, evangelical Christians believe that. That number has slipped probably into the 40s now when it comes to this, that statement. That's a big statement. And if you really believe that, and you really, really, really believe it, and then you start reading the Bible, it's certainly going to change the way you live your life, if you really believe it. Now, that, that statement is not just based on a couple of people that are smart sitting around the room trying to figure out nice words to declare what the Bible is. That's based on Scripture. You can go to 2 Timothy 3, 16. Read what it has to say there. Another passage found in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, verse 21. These are what make up this passage of this statement of faith of ours. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Psalms 119, verse 105 and verse 160. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. Proverbs 30, verse 5. On and on this list could go. You can download that off our website if you'd like to look at it a little bit further. But it's a statement that we believe at Believer's Fellowship, the Bible's God's Word. I, I have based my and staked my life on that. I live my life by that. And many of you do as well. You really believe the Bible is God's word. And what God says about sending his son to die, you believe that. And you believe that verse in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. You believe that. You walk in that. You trust that. That's what we believe at Believer's Fellowship. That's where we get our statement of faith. That's where we get our marching orders, so to say. That's where we get the, the, the direction for every ministry that we begin and everything that we carry out. It goes back to this light that God has given us called the Holy Word of God, the Bible, the revelation of His Word. Now, in studying that, what happens is the Bible says that thy word is a 
lamp unto my feet. So what the Bible does, it's a light that gives us light. So there's a second area I want to talk about in regard to the church and being a church that charges hell and a Christian that lives that way. is this revelation of the will of God that's given to us through the Holy Spirit. He births a vision in our heart and spirit about his will and purposes. When we start dealing with this issue of a church, we want to believe with all our heart that something that God has started and something that God has created. We're not just trying to have another organization, which is just a dead group of committees and things like that. What we want is a living organism where there's life, where people's hearts are being affected, their lives are being changed, their children's lives are being changed, their marriages are, are growing richer and deeper, their lives are growing richer and deeper. So what God does, he takes his word and begins to call us and deal with us and re reveal how he wants to use us, how he wants to use our church, how he wants to use our life. And it's so important. You know, Proverbs puts it this way in Proverbs 29, 18, that without a vision, the people perish. I think that you have to get a glimpse, folks, of what God's doing in your life and how it relates to what God's doing in his church, what he's doing in his kingdom, what he's doing in his purposes in the earth, that God has a place for you and God has a purpose for you. We need to be, what we talked about for six weeks about being stewards, we need to be stewards of that call and those giftings that God gives us. The Bible makes it clear he's given you a spiritual gift, and if you don't know what it is, that's not God's fault. You need to pursue God and pursue his word. He'll begin to reveal to you what your gifts are. God has given you, I believe, natural abilities, natural inclination, natural things that you lean to and are inclined to and are good at. Those are gifts as well from the Lord, not spiritual gifts. They're more along the line of talents and, 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 and inclinations that the Lord gives, things that you enjoy doing. It could well be that those things that light your fire in life are the very things that God wants you doing in his church for the glory of God. But it, it, this is just loss. I think this is why so few people today are even responding and so few young people are responding to the call to ministry and the call to service for God. A part of that is they've seen so many failures in leadership, I believe part of the problem is there. And the media has made such a big deal about people's failures. Hey, God forgives failure. And everybody's going to fail. Not everybody may make TV over it. But sooner or later, we all stumble in many ways, the Apostle James said. And that's why we have this God of grace and forgiveness. But there's so few people responding to the call. It could well be, young people, in this room today, God wants you in service in a full-time vocational sense, in missions or in ministry in some area of your life. You need to be paying attention. You'll waste your life. You'll get at the end of your life and say, that was a bummer. That was a waste of time. It could well be because you took a wrong turn at a very vital time in your life when God was calling you something that was bigger than yourself. And because it was so big, you backed out. Don't back out. Hear what God is saying to you. Without a vision, people perish. You perish. People around us perish. And the vision is what? I believe the vision is not about how great I'm going to be, but it's how great God can be when he gets a hold of me and how great God can be when he gets a hold of a church and how great God can be when he gets a hold of our lives. So this vision that God gives us, it comes from his word, God speaks to our heart. Isaiah is a real good illustration of that in Isaiah 6. He's in ministry already. He's a prophet. But he's gone through a time in his life where he's walking in a place of deadness and coldness and spiritual sterility. He's just not moving forward. No passion in his life. But then he has this vision of the glory of God filling the temple. And he said when he saw this big God and the glory of this great God, that his heart was broken and he begins to confess his sin. He said, woe unto me, Lord, for I'm a man, I am undone. What's that mean? Half-baked? <laughs> I'm not, I, the, the cooking process has stalled. I'm not, I'm not done yet. You're still working on me. And I have somehow stalled out in the process of letting the cooking job finish. We don't like the heat sometimes, but it's the heat that provides the finished product. And he said, I'm undone. Woe is me. I'm a man. And, he, and then he, he got specific. He said, I got a dirty mouth. He said, I got unclean lips. The things that are coming out of my mouth are not things that glorify you. They're not things that are, he didn't go into detail about what that was. It could be anything, couldn't it? There's a lot of things that come out of our, our mouth. And what's that just a testament of what's in our heart? What your heart is full of is what your lips will be babbling. Amen? 
And he said, he said and he, he confessed his sin, and God takes the tongs and, and, for, and goes to the holy altar and takes those hot coals off and applies it to his, his mouth. Basically, this is, this is a symbol of God's forgiveness and his grace to purge that was impure away from him. And, he, and, and, and he's broken, but it's a moment not of searing pain. Yes, there's searing conflict because there's conviction, and he's not running from what God's telling him. He's being honest. Too many people at this point run off. He stays and let God do a work. And like, yeah, I'm wrong. I'm messed up. And God forgives him in this moment. And then God begins, catch this. And this is in quotes in Isaiah 6. Isaiah says this, quotation marks. Then I heard the voice of the Lord speaking, saying, whom shall I send? God said, I have something I want to do. Now, the interesting part, it says, then is when, all right, when I heard. When was then? When he got right, when he got honest, when he confessed his, his, his sin, right? When he got real before God, and that's when he confessed his sin. He says, after I confessed my sin and God cleansed me in my heart, he said, then I heard the voice of the Lord. It could well be in our lives we don't get this vision of what God wants, how God wants to use us and how God wants to call us because we won't let God bring us to that place of contrition, that place of brokenness, that place of repentance. We fight it. We resist it. I don't want to be honest about my life. I enjoy my sin. I don't want to have to, you know, and whatever it is, you know, because Satan's got one lie he uses over and over and over again. He used it in the Garden of Eden when he says, you know, Eve, if you, you eat this apple, God's trying to hold something back on you. Because, hey, you eat that apple, you'll find out what God's been holding out on you. You'll be like God. In other words, what he tries to tell us is, you can enjoy life, you can have fullness, but, you know, you do it your way. Pursue your desires, Eve. Go do what you want to do. And that's when, that's when failure always comes. When we choose what we want, or we get this idea, well, God's trying, to, God's trying to mess my life up. I won't be happy. You'll never be happy without God. Let me tell you the truth. You keep living the lie, idea that if I do that for God, or if I give up to God, if I sacrifice the Lord, then I just want, oh, you know, I, well, Joel, I'll, I'll be happy. You ain't happy now. You're not. You got to jack yourself up with something the world has to offer, with snort something, smoke something, eat something, drink something, do something, you know. Now I'll be happy. You, you've missed out life. That's not what God intends you to live your life. Jesus said, I've come, you might have it more abundantly. I don't see a lot of folks running around with abundant life because they're missing this, this connection between the vision that God has to use their life. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? That's what, I heard the Lord after I got right with God, and, and God was speaking. God was probably talking all the time about this. He just hadn't heard it. It's like something new because his heart got right. Now, if you're sitting in the jury here and you're watching this event take place, and there's, there's that sinner Isaiah, that sorry preacher, look at him, he's getting, he got a dirty mouth, and look, God's forgetting his sin. God wants to send somebody. Don't send Isaiah, he's got a dirty mouth. Don't send Isaiah, he failed. Don't send Isaiah, he ain't nobody anymore. God won't use him, he, he, had, he had a mess up. You know what Isaiah's doing? Whom shall I send? Woohoo! Try me, send me. I, but that's what happens, I believe. We begin to realize the glory of God and the greatness of Jesus and, the, and, the, and His presence in our life and His love for our life and His forgiveness and His cleansing in our life. And now He sets us free and says, Then we get this attitude I need to embrace this vision. And I, I just give you a couple quick things here about this vision. One, it has to be for your church and for yourself, it has to be visualized on your part. And I'm not talking about in a new age sense, you know. Of visualizing, but I'm talking about you got to see it. You got to take time to spend some time with God and see, like Isaiah, see, wait on God, hear from God, see what God wants to do. Because I believe God will speak to your heart and show you exactly what it is. And then not just not good enough to know that God's got a call, and even know even maybe some specifics about it. There has to be a response on your part. You have to embrace and personalize this and let it become your vision. Ultimately, it becomes our vision as a church. Every ministry that we've sought to start in Believer's Fellowship for the last 30 years has come back down to this. Is this what God is doing? Is this what God is leading? Is this who God's raising up to do this? And if it is, let's get behind it and embrace this vision that God has for us and let it become real to ourselves. That vision is important. It must be realized, and it will be realized. 1 Corinthians says this, 
For a great and effectual door has been opened. That's Paul said, I have a vision for what God wants to do. Uh, but there are many adversaries. Let me tell you, every time there's a great and effectual door, every time there's an opportunity to serve the Lord, every time God directs your heart about what he wants to do, there's always adversaries. There's always adversaries. You know, how many people I've talked to over the years, I can't even number anymore, who said, who came to me and said, I want to start this ministry. And they start this ministry. And I mean, this is people, back when I was even traveling in evangelism, I, I did a lot of churches where I'd go back two or three, four times over the years. And I'd always run into people I'd met and friends who, at the first meeting, they would say something, God's called me to start this particular work or this kind of street ministry or this bus ministry or whatever it might be. And then to see them a year later, say, how's that going? I remember when I was here last, God, you said, God giving you a real burden for that. How's that going? Oh, brother it just didn't work out like I thought well there was a lot of problems there was a lot of stuff come against me in that well welcome to the real world amen there's always going to be difficulties there's always going to be conflict that's why the Lord said the gates of hell won't prevail against you there and you claim your promise Lord you called me to this so let's start with this. We start with the lordship of Jesus, making sure that we're maintaining our submission to him as our king, as our lord, as our master, and our lord and savior. And then we come to the place where we embrace his word, which brought us to him to start with. And we say, Lord, how do you want to use me? And how do you want to operate in my life? Because you've given me spiritual gifts as well as abilities and talents. I want to use those for, your, your, for you because I want to be a steward because I do realize, as Romans says, every one of us has to give an account to the Lord on one day of what we did with what he blessed us with. Then it brings this last part, which is this, laborers. Matthew 9 says, Then said he unto the disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. few. Pray therefore to the Lord of harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. What the Lord is telling his disciples, you know, the world's ripe and ready for picking. There's people with needs all around us who need me, whose hearts are broken, whose lives need mending, who's, who are living in hell. I want to change their hearts and life. And the harvest is so massive, but there are so few people that's in responding. I know that our, our lift leaders just went to a seminar, and one of the major topics they covered at the lift seminars, finding people to put in leadership roles to start new ministries and those kind of things. Finding people that are responsible was, was, was one of the deals. It's a question that, that preachers are always asking when I do the conferences that I do. How do you get more people involved in ministry? Here's the answer. Pray. God still answers. God's, God's still inviting us to ask him. You know, we have not because we want we don't have because we don't ask. Why don't we ask? And ask in faith and ask believing. Because all around us, there's people who, whose lives need to be touched. How many other people do you know uh, that God wants to do something in their life? There's millions upon billions of people in this world who need a difference made in their life. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Says, I want you to pray for these laborers that I will send them forth. In other words, I'll, so I can't call people. God has to do it, right? I can tell you I want you to teach a Sunday school class or a Bible study class or a lift class or lead that ministry. But ultimately, if God's not doing a work in your heart, I'm wasting my time. So I need to pray to the Lord to help me to identify who he's calling. That's something different than what I'm saying, me trying to motivate people for ministry to get more people. Let's just find out what God's doing because I believe many of you here today that may not be involved in some real ministry activity in your life, there's one waiting for you to be involved in. It's just waiting for you to hear what God's saying to you and get forth because we need to prepare and be ready for the harvest that God's giving is to have a labors that are going forth. That word in the Greek language where the Lord says, I will, I'll send him, he used the word in the Greek he uses in the book of Revelation for when it talks about the, the angels of the Lord and the bowls of wrath of how they be thrust into the earth. Literally, the Lord says, I'll thrust people into ministry. I'll energize them. I'll touch, I'll touch their life. I'll, they will literally, in fact, a lot of times this word is ekbalo. It means with violent force to thrust something in. God says, pray that I, I would do that. Pray that I'll energize people. I'll, I'll change people's hearts and lives and throw them right into to the work of the ministry for the saints and for the church and for the lost world. You know, the, the Bible doesn't shy away from works. It says that we shouldn't have works for our salvation. In other words, nobody here is going to be able to do a lot of stuff and say, oh, well, I did this and I did that, you know, and stand before God. And God says, why did I let you in? Oh, God, you know, let me in here because, you know, I, uh, I helped a little old lady across the street. And I, I jump-started that guy's car the other day. He didn't have any cables. I had cables, so I use my cables for you. I go to church. Man, that's sacrifice enough to have to listen to that preacher every Sunday. I go to church, you know, and I'm a good person. I, I, this is my, my two favorites. I never robbed a bank, 
Anybody know the next one? And I never, you see, y'all used it too, huh? <laughs> I never killed anybody. Like they think that God's going to get everybody up before the throne one day and he's going to say, all right, all you bank robbers go to hell. All you killers go with them. <laughs> We're so warped, amen. We don't quite get it. It's not, we don't get saved by our works. We get saved because we put our trust in Jesus. He did everything for us. But Ephesians says in 2, 8, 9 that we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. That's where our, that goes, amen. But he goes on to say in verse 10, he said, but though we're not saved by works, God's called us to, to works. And he says, he called us to works which he preordained. What does that mean? He says, long before you were born, God had a plan for your life. That's good to know. If I sit around and just try to figure out my own plan, it's just going to be a mess, Amen. But God called us to works that he's, he's already got something he wants us to be doing. It's time for me to find out what it is. Quit waiting around for somebody to bless me and go be a blessing. Waiting around for somebody to help me and maybe I need to just go help somebody. The Bible talks about that we toil for the Lord. We, we work for the Lord. It, it, it's, it's what we do. In fact, the very word ministry, people say, I want a ministry. It comes from the word diakonos, which we get the word servant for and even the de deacon from. You know? It means to, to serve. I want to serve. I want to, I want to honor you. I, I want to be a blessing to the church and to the world around me. I want to be a difference maker. I want to be that person. And over and over and over through the scriptures, you see things like, you know, where James is talking to those people who are hypocritical and says, you know, they, they, those people, they look into the word, calls it the perfect law of liberty, and they, they never change. They're just forgetful hearers. He said, but I want you to be, here's the way he put it, a doer of the word. The doer of the word. We talked about that light we received a while ago. Whatever God's showing us, what he's speaking to our heart, that's what we do. Now, obviously, we're all called to do certain things, to live for Jesus, to share our faith, to read the Word and study Scripture and to minister to one another. But it goes deeper and deeper and deeper as we start discovering what this doer of the Word. We're builders. We're participating. It's the word kopos in the, in the Greek language, which has to do with, you know, just literally working hard. There's another word, uh, ergon, which has to do with effort put forth. These are the words that are used in, in, in response to what Christians do. There's the... the Hebrew equivalent for the Old Testament is the Hebrew word amal. And it's the word that's used over in, uh, in Psalms 127 verse 1. It, said, it says there, except the Lord build, work, the house. And it goes on to say, the labor, the worker, the work he does is in vain. What's he saying? The Lord has to lead you. You're going to follow his leadership. It's not you doing something of your own accord for your own glory, for your own self. You're doing what God wants you to do, and you're doing it in accordance with the way he's doing it through his church and, because, and as a result of the word of God in your life. What are, what are the characteristics of that? You know, Paul wrote the church. This, this is my closing verse with a, with a few points underneath it. But what he says here, and it's, it, the, the, the picture of the real Christian leader is found in 1 Corinthians. And he says this, uh, 15. And this is after he talked about spiritual gifts and their place in the body of Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, you be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Catch these words. I want you to be steadfast. I think most of us understand the context of that. From, from the word the language it was originally written in, the Greek language, it means to be absolutely fixed, as firm as a rock. In fact, the verb here is, it's a kind of a, an active tense verb, and it's really says, keep on becoming steadfast. Keep on becoming firm. Keep on becoming unshaken. It's the process of our life. But not only are we steadfast, we're unmovable. Well, obviously, if we're being steadfast here, we won't be so easily moved. Most Baptists sitting around singing that old song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. But they don't, they, they don't got the right sense. It's not moved from, your, not moved from my place in the Lord. Most of them are seeing it not move from their place of where they are in their walk with the Lord. They're, they're stuck in a place of immaturity and they're stuck in a place of deadness and they ain't moving. They're cold and callous and calculating and critical of everything that goes on. But here is a whole different story. Don't let anything shake you away from what God's called you to do. Don't let anything tear you away. Don't let anything influence you away. Don't let anything call you away. You stay in the will of God and he says that's where you'll be always abounding. And that is a word which means super abounding, over and above abounding. Your life will mean something. Most people don't have that, what we mentioned a while ago, where Jesus said you can have abundant life. They don't have this abundance here, this always abounding. They don't, they don't experience their life. They're, just, they're kind of in a rut. 
in their rituals and routines of life. They don't, they don't have any joy and victory in what they're doing, or they've lost that joy and victory in what they're doing. Like Isaiah, they have to come back to the place where the presence of God and say, God, deal with my dirty heart. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want the fire back in my bones. You know, I want to be what you've called me to be. And in that place there, we find the, that moment of always abounding. And here's these important words, but it's never in vain. It's never in vain. What you do for the glory of God, no matter how minimal, minuscule, tiny in your mind it might be, in God's mind, if it's for the Lord, it's big stuff. You might say, well, I just greet. I just help with the nursery. I just help with children's church. Or I just, I work with the youth some. Or I just, that's no just with the Lord. Everything you're doing for the glory of God with a pure heart is big. And it's powerful. And it makes a difference in other people's lives. And it's for the glory of God, therefore it's eternal. And God said, I'm not, I'm not going to forget this. I will reward this. In fact, in Hebrews, you put it this way. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you've showed toward his name, and you've ministered to the saints, and you do minister. What's he saying? God's not going to forget all you're doing. You may think nobody cares and nobody appreciates you. And man, Pastor Joe hadn't patted you on the, beak in a, on the back in a month and told you to. Hey, and Brother Tim hadn't told you you're the greatest lift group leader for a month. So it just, what's the use? It's not in vain. God's not going to forget what you've done. New American Standard puts it away. God is not un, unjust so as to forget your work and the love you show in his name. One translation with it, God is not unfair. How can he forget your hard work for him or forget the way you used to show your love for him and still do by helping his family? The closing chapters in Revelation 22 of the Bible, there's those words from Jesus that, hey, you better be ready. I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to the work he's done. That's a positive thing for us. That's a, that's a blessed thing for us. Romans 16 closes that with just a few little, little, little personal illustrations of all this as Paul highlights some people in the church. It, it was kind of his appreciation moment where we had our lift appreciation moment. We brought people forward and pointed them out for their hard work and their sacrifice. You say, what's hard work and sacrifice about a lift group? You do it. Or even just do it in your house. Christians make a mess. Believers fellowship people make a bigger mess. You got to get your house clean, first of all, because you know somebody's going to come in and say, oh, look at that. Am I right? Come on. You can be honest for this one moment, lift leaders. Okay? You, you mean, they're going to come in. They're going to point out something. Well, that, wasn't, that was broke last week. When I was there. He hadn't fixed that yet. And then they leave most of the time. They didn't do it. You know, there's always one or two going to stick around and help a little bit. But, hey, you know, there's more deep cleaning to be done after that. It's not, it's like I say, if it's so easy, you do it, right? Well, we don't do it because it's easy. We do what we do because God's called us to do these things. But look at Romans 16. Paul's just wrapping it all up, and he's telling the church at Rome. He's pointing out some people. It's kind of this is appreciation moment. And he talks about one, this person he calls a hard worker. He says, and this is the Living Bible, says, uh, there's Phoebe. A dear Christian woman from the town of Sincrea will be coming to see you soon. And Phoebe's worked hard in the church there. You receive her as your sister of the Lord. Give her a warm Christian welcome. Help her in every way you can, for she has helped many in their needs, including me. How many could say, hey, you know, I, I, you, know you could call me. You know, how many women could say here, I, I'm a Phoebe. I work hard for the Lord. And I help. We've got some Phoebes in our church, praise the Lord. We've got a bunch of Phoebes in our church. And we've got some Want to be Phoebes, praise the Lord. And we got a bunch of should be Phoebes. <laughs> you classify yourself. That's not my job. My job is just to lay it out there and for you to respond as the Lord leads it. And then he talks about these, these two here. These are what we call loyal workers. They're consistent. You greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. Listen to this. Who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. You talk about a group of people that are loyal. In verse 5, he says, and greet the churches in their house. Excuse me, these are lift group leaders? But these aren't just lift group leaders. These are guys who told Paul, we're going to go the extra mile. And if you're going to face the sword, we'll face the sword. 
If, if they're threatening to cut your head off, here's our neck. We're going to lay ours out there beside you. You're not in this alone, Brother Paul. This is a family effort. This is a joint venture. All right? So that's just powerful to me. I mean, I, we've got some folks like this. There's some folks, if I told you right now, hey, get your water pistols. We're getting ready to charge hell. <laughs> You'd load up with your big splash and we'd head out. <laughs> Amen? We're going to put the flames out with our water pistols. You say, that sounds stupid, but hey, it worked before. Let's go again. <laughs> you, you're just, you, you, the help that you provide to your pastors, to your staff, is phenomenal. You're, you're this kind of individual. And then he talks about this other, these others here. And, and this is what I call the consistent. They're faithful. They're, it's not in and out with them. They're steadfast. They, it's not for themselves. They don't bail out the first time of trouble. It says, you greet Mary. She's bestowed much labor is the word. And the Greek word is kapeo. It means she is totally, she wearies herself. She works to the point of, of just tiredness and exhaustion. She labors with every effort. And we have some people like this in our church too. And I, I'm in awe. I mean, you come around here during the week sometime, watch what some of our marriages do. And how they prepare to meet people's needs, whether it's in a food pantry, the food, clothing pantry, or just preparing mail outs at times. Doing something for the glory. Let me involved. And, and there's, there's a couple more here. I want you to catch this. There's no football on today. Chapter 16, verse 7, he says this. Salute Adronicus and Junior, my kinsmen my fellow prisoners who are noted among the apostles who are also in Christ before me. He says, hey, I want you to see these guys. They got saved before I did. But I want you to note, Adronicus and Junior, that my kinsmen, he calls them, and that's what he says, my fellow prisoners. Not only is Paul taking note of them, and not only is the church taking note of them, obviously Rome took note of them because they hated the Christians. So not only are they imprisoning Paul, he says, these guys are going to stick their neck out like, like them. They got imprisoned with me. They worked so hard. They were so consistent. They were sacrificial. Hey, that even the lost world took note of them. They better shut them up because they're making too much of a difference in people's lives. They're upsetting too many carts. What's he say? He said, these guys, they work with me. And in, in, in verse 12, he, said, he says this. Uh, Greet Trifonia and Trifosa, workers in the Lord. Greet Persis, the beloved who has worked hard in the Lord. That's that one we has to do back wearying ourselves. Sometimes we just, if we're really serious about what God's called us to do, we're going to do that extra mile. We're going to go that extra step because we're really committed to what God has told us to do. And there's loyalty and there's sacrifice and there's commitment and there's consistency. This church, Believer's Fellowship, both campuses, they would not exist if we didn't have people like this. The people that consistently show up and do ministry and do service from children to the stage to, to serving you and meeting you and greeting you and helping you and ministering to your families. They, they, they're, these folks, they're going to shine like stars for eternity. They may not have their moment of instant fame here on the planet, but there's a bigger day coming where they're going to shine, the Bible says, like stars forever. They're going to be recognized. You're going to be, he says, it's never in vain. But let me introduce you to my last couple. They're some of my favorites. These guys, we call them the habitual workers. I beseech you, brethren, you should know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Asia, and they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. These guys were addicts. And we're living in a world of addicts. Everybody understands addictions, right? Today, we've got alcohol addicts, drug addicts, you know, sex addicts. We've got all kinds of addicts in the world running around. And this is an interesting twist on this word. When you start looking at the, the Greek word and what it's saying here, it's the same word when he's talking about an addiction here that we get that verb from a, of submission. It's that word tasso in the Greek language, to put something in order. So what does an addict do? An addict puts something in order. This is what's first in my life. And an addict will spend all his time trying how to figure out to make either alcohol or drugs or sex or money or whatever it is that he's addicted to, to put that first in their life. And there's a lot of effort that goes into that. You know, I got to get the scripts, I got to get the booze, I got to get the money, I got to get, you know, all, there's a lot of effort that goes in. Any amen from addicts here? You know, post addicts? Okay. I'm post addict, so I can say that. I have a new addiction, which is a whole lot more fun and costs a whole lot less. And doesn't leave me hungover. Hallelujah. But it literally means to put something in a, in a priority place, that it goes first. It, the station of ministry for these guys is it took first place. What they were going to do for God, that was the priority of their life is what he's saying here. They had this priority set. 
Jesus first, church first, ministry first, service first. I love God. I want this to be a part of my life. Now, obviously, it should be first for all of us, the Lord and what he's called us to, should it not? But I love the way he brings out, you know, this house. Go look at the Stephanus house. Man, these guys, you talk about somebody in love with Jesus, they've made it a priority of their life. We just call it, they're addicted to the ministry. Hey, you ought to try. It's a good addiction. It's a good addiction. And we should be looking at these people, these loyal, hard, consistent, sacrificial workers. That's first century church. It's not supposed to be any different in this century, 21st century church. Why? Because if you're a Christian, you have within you the very presence of God made alive in you. Your body, according to what the Bible we believe teaches, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the capacity in Christ Jesus to do anything that God calls you to do, anything he lays upon your heart, any vision, any passion, any burden he puts on you. The world will resist it. Satan will try to rail against you. Adversarial situations will arise. But you are unique and you are different. And what happens when we start realizing the uniqueness of our life and respond to it, that's when revival breaks out. And that's when great things begin to happen. It matters. Your ministry matters. And you all have a ministry if you're a Christian. How do you know that? Because that's what the Bible teaches. We've all received a gift from God. And the Bible says we should all use the gift that God's given us for his glory. We find our place and we serve the Lord there. We don't measure it by somebody bigger or better or smarter than other somebody else. Hey, the Bible makes it clear that this is, this is all about, you know, there's some who sow and some who reap, but it's all about we're all part of the same body. We're all part of the same fellowship. We're all one in the Lord. So if someone's praying here to receive Christ or someone's getting their life right or their family right or their marriage right, that's everybody doing it. That's all of us from the music team to the prayer team to the lift group ministries to the, to the church as a whole. I love this church. This, this is a neat fellowship. We got a long way to go. So don't be patting yourself on the back too much. But man, God is doing so many great things here. And the witness that I see all the time is so many of you. I look across this room and see, and see people who's, you're just doing some things that a lot of folks are not going to want to do. But God has not forgotten what you're doing. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we faint not. Amen? Let's stand with our heads bowed.